From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. It's always a pleasure on John Hannah Meets to interview uh, Paul Nicholas. <laughs> Great to see you. Oh, my phone's just gone off, John. <laughs> Hang on. I've just turned mine off so there was this no is, embarrassment. This is modern technology. <laughs> um, OK, there you go, it's gone. When we first met, no one had mobile phones, Paul. Exactly. As we speak, you're in a national tour of quartet. Yes. And I know it's going well, isn't it? It is. It's a, it's a, it's a very well-written play and... Um, I think that's the reason that we're all doing it, because we all do things as performers sometimes that we think are great and sometimes we think are not so great. But this particular play by Ronald Harwood, who wrote The Dresser, uh, is very well written and it's very suitable for the people that are playing it, because uh, you have to be over a certain age to play this part. It says in the script, actually, in fact, I'm the only one who qualifies, really, because the writer says that everyone should be over 70 the actors who play it, and I'm the only one who really is. Uh, Sue's under 70, Sue Holderness. Wendy is a child, she's only 50. <laughs> and Jeff Rolls is a, probably about 67. So I'm really the superior older man in the company. Well, superior's not the part of the right word, but I mean, <laughs> I, I do qualify, whereas they don't. And a lot of the comedy <laughs> applies to you, doesn't it? Well, it, it applies to all of us because we're all playing old people in a in a in a old people's home, uh, basically old retired opera singers. But all the quirks and various things that old people go through, like memory loss and uh, can't remember where you put things and uh, getting confused, they're all in there. Plus, all the things that you know go wrong with you. You know, like I have a speech where I say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, growing old means you you get up and pee three times nightly. <laughs> then your hearing goes, your teeth fall out. <laughs> then your eyes start watering and it's cataracts. Then you can't remember anyone's name. Then you can't remember your own name. And the doctors know nothing, you know. Have a have a bypass, try a pacemaker. What about a pig's valve? And so on. <laughs> so you get the flavour of... <laughs> Off the piece. We've got all this to come, but and, and also, of course, I have a bad hip, as indeed Sue does. So I do the whole thing on a walking stick. <laughs> so, it's, uh, so my days of uh, leaping up and doing the Pirate King are probably behind me. Paul, when you were in Paul Dean and the Dreamers in mm. the very early sixties, you never anticipated you'd still be really working and. Uh, uh, at Did this you? age, no, it's true, I didn't actually. Um, and sometimes I sort of have to pinch myself that in fact I am. And I'm very, very lucky um, to be working at my age. And it's, of course, very good for me because one of the things about this play is it's very, very wordy. There are a lot of words and just memorising the words is a bit of a challenge, as you know, when you get a bit older, it does become a little bit more difficult. So all those things are very good. The discipline of doing eight shows a week is also very good. And although I'm, we do a quite a lot of sitting down and walking with sticks, it's still a physical exercise to some extent. So all those things are very good for an older act. And I think really that the secret, if you can, when you get older, is to keep working, is to keep mobile, is to keep active both mentally and physically. Those are, I think, the best ingredients for staying, you know, compass mentis, really. And, of course, unlike hair, you don't have to take your clothes off for this one, do you? Well, no, people actually would pay me not to take my clothes <laughs> off, I think, in this day and age. Uh, but, uh, in fact, there's a, the 50th anniversary of hair, uh, Going on Broadway opened earlier this year. There was a show in London to celebrate the opening in Broadway. But in fact, the London opening is this year. We opened 50 years ago in September this year. Wow. So uh, we may get a little concert together, and indeed we won't be taking our clothes off. <laughs> Although having said that, if we did the full show, I'm sure many members of the cast would still <laughs> take their clothes off. And of course, Jesus Christ Superstar in the early days, which was a fantastic role for you, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that was again coming up to 50 years ago. I mean, 1972 that was. And uh, that was my second job. And 
you know, from, from doing hair, which was pretty straightforward, playing a young person, to suddenly playing Jesus Christ, in what was then a brand new form of the rock opera, although they'd done Tommy, Tommy had been produced certainly on record, but not as a West End show. So this was a first uh, for Andrew and Tim. And uh, I remember that uh, there was a lot of protesting about this show, you know, at the front of the palace. People said, you know, calling Jesus Christ a superstar was, was a bit much and probably still is for a lot of people. We had a lot of people protesting at front, but of course it did go on to become an enormous hit and I think a lot of people found the show very moving and uh, you know it has continued to be a, a great success over these many years. Your pop star days, do you look back on that with sort of great pleasure? It was an irritant to me uh, having started off as a pop singer, uh, well, well certainly in bands anyway not so much as a pop singer but playing piano and being in rock bands that I'd never had a hit record. And I think the one thing you do want if you if you do take that road is to have success, you know, recording wise. And so I got to about 30, I'd done all these shows like Superstar and Hair and various other things and thought I really would still like to have achieved what I never achieved. So I went looking for what I thought was a, possibly a hit song because I don't write songs. I mean, I do, but not hit songs. And I came across these two writers called Bugatti and Muska, uh, who played me lots and lots of songs, uh, none of which sounded like hits to me at that time. This is about 1975. And eventually, as I was leaving, they played me this song called Reggae Like It Used To Be. Mm -hmm. And they were rather embarrassed to play it because it was really very much a straightforward bubblegum pop song. And I thought, well, that sounds like a hit. And I took their recording, put my voice on it. Chris Neal, who went on to do great things producing wise, produced it for me. And it was a hit. And thereafter, we had about three or four others. Uh, and I sort of got it out of my system, really. It wasn't something I wanted to continue to do forever, because, you know, there's so many, so many times you can sing Dancer with the Captain. Yes. <laughs> you, in the Neil Diamond movie, you were a bit of a nasty in that, weren't you? Yeah, I was living in America at the time and uh, looking for work and they were doing a film of the jazz singer and they were looking for what they thought was a punk singer. <laughs> and I was, you know, punk really originated here in England. So they were looking for a geezer like me and I happened to be living in Los Angeles. And so I did this not particularly large scene with, with Neil Diamond in which I took... Love on the Rocks, which became a big hit for him, and sort of did a punk version on it. Yeah. And he walks into the studio <laughs> and says, no, 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 we don't do it like that. That's not how I want it sung. And then he sang it as it became, you know, as, as everyone knows it. And at the end of it, I told him to piss off. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that, that was a thrill to tell Neil Diamond to piss off. <laughs> so many of us love Vince Pinner, really, because that was one of the best sitcoms, Paul, that I, I think that I've ever seen. Just yeah. for Friends was, was a dream, wasn't it, really? Yeah, and again, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about this business is you're never quite sure what's around the corner. And uh, I was in Cats at the time, and I got a call from my agent saying, uh, John Sullivan and Ray Butt, who was the director of Coming to See You in Cats, and could you meet them afterwards? So I did. And then they sent me a script of Just Good Friends. And I thought, oh, this is good. So I went in and then I met Jan Francis, who was also waiting to be kind of interviewed. And we both went in for this interview in front of John Sullivan, the writer, and Ray Butt, the producer. And Jan and I hit it off almost immediately, because we were hoping we wouldn't have to read, you know, to mm. audition as such. But we did have to audition. And uh, we got on very well. And uh, Ray said to John, well, it seems all right, doesn't it? And John says, yeah, they seem all right. <laughs> so uh, we did the pilot, and that seemed to go very well, although there was some, there was some debate about whether I would be right for it, because the head of comedy at that point was a chap called John Howard Davis, who actually had played Oliver in the original Alec Guinness version of the mm. film. So I think he was a bit nervous about whether I could sustain this 
uh, performance over a series because having been a pop singer, uh, I think he was a bit nervous. But anyway, they ran a very extensive poll uh, amongst six secretaries whether or not I was any good or not. And they all liked me, so I <laughs> continued to keep the part. That smile too. <laughs> and uh, yes, so that all did. Uh, so we did very well. And of course, again, it was really down to the writing. You know, it was beautifully written by John, who of course wrote Fools and Horses and many others. And those kind of jobs and that kind of class of writing doesn't come up very often, you know. A bit like this play, you know, this is a very well written play. And there is a big difference between something being okay and something being good. And a lot of the time you're doing stuff that's okay. Because um, you don't have the luxury really as a as a as an actor. Actors don't really have the luxury to be able to turn stuff down because, you know, there's a lot of actors and not as much work. So they have to do things sometimes that they're not thrilled with. Although you never know, sometimes things work that you don't think are going to work and sometimes things, you know go the other way but uh, so I was very lucky to have got just good friends I've seen you in Barnum singing in the rain Fiddler Dr Doolittle Jekyll yeah. and Hyde The Haunting yeah you've had a great variety of touring live shows haven't you really yeah I th well the thing the thing is as I said you know the thing about being able to do lots of different things like appear in musicals or plays is that you do keep your options a little bit more open if you're a straight actor and that's all you do then you immediately lose any chance of working in a musical because you need to be able to sing so to be able to do more than one thing is very useful in terms of keeping yourself employed eastenders gavin sullivan did you sort of have a wish to go into a soap or was that just the opportunity no i got a call i think the reason i went into it was because they had to bring gillian tailforth back who had been apparently murdered or was dead so they had to invent a backstory. And the backstory was me and her going to South Africa or something. And it turns out that I was Letitia Dean's father. Yes. So it's all terribly complicated. <laughs> I'm sure EastEnders fans know the backstory better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I ended up doing a scene with a lady who turned out to be my sister. And I threw her off a roof. For some was reason. that Jan Harvey playing that? Yeah, part, was it? yeah. I threw off a roof. I wasn't quite sure why I did it. She probably annoyed me. <laughs> and as I was being dragged away by the police, I always say this: I was screaming, "But I need this job." <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't seem to make any effect. So I was taken away, and uh, all, like all these things, whether well, you know, I don't suppose they'll, they'll want me back because I think I was really there to support. Gillian's re-entry into the show but it was an enjoyable experience and an interesting one and I don't think those actors get enough credit you know they're very very good at what they do Letitia Dean's wonderful Gillian's wonderful and Steve McFadden's wonderful they're all wonderful they have to constantly learning lines so the pressure on them is terrific and it's a very well done show and considering the turnaround and how quickly they do it you know, I take my hat off to them because they, they do a fantastic job. Gavin was described as dangerous, sinister, nasty, evil. You were a real baddie in that, weren't you? Apparently, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I never, wasn't quite sure why, but my, I didn't really ask the questions. I just went in and, and did it. But uh, as I said, it was an interesting and enjoyable experience. Did you kidnap Phil Mitchell? I'm sure you did, didn't you? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> In more yes, I did. Yes, I you did. did, yes, amongst many other. You yeah. had some great storylines, Paul, which was good from your point of view, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, it's a, it's a top-rated show, and, you know, I'm glad I did it. And, you know, if they said, well, Gavin's escape prison or whatever, would you like to do some more? I'd say, of course. In more recent years, you've also done the uh, sort of... Well, you did the Royal Marigold Hotel. Oh, you? yes. Now, I think you're ideally suited to that because you're up for anything, aren't you? And, and I mean, some of the clothes you bought and wore and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, it was an interesting thing, you know. Uh, first of all, it, it, the reason I did it was, first of all, I was asked to do it. And, you know, my wife had enjoyed it. I've never actually watched it. 
But I've seen clips of it, but I've never actually watched it because I thought, well, the thing about those shows is that if you go in with too much of a fixed idea about how you're going to be and what you're going to do, you kind of take the spontaneity away from yourself. So I li deliberately didn't watch it. Um, but the only thing I was slightly nervous about was doing, you know, being with eight other or seven other actors, celebrities, whatever you want to call them, uh, in a house. Because we've all seen those Big Brother things. Mm. But I think the reason that the, the Marigold Hotel works well is, A, you don't get voted off. So you don't have to, so much pressure about competition with the other performers. And you don't get the feeling that the producers want it to be a nasty show. You get the feeling that they want it to be a nice show, that people can, you know, enjoy themselves and be interested in where they are, which in turn will, you know, be reflected to the audience who watch. So I wasn't remotely worried about that, except I didn't know how the others would be, and they all turned out to be very nice. I think when you get to, you know, plus 65 or plus 60 or whatever, you know, you've sort of been there and done it all, you've, you've, You've worn the T-shirt. You don't need to, you know, compete really. And that thing of not having to be voted off, you know, takes the pressure off people. So it was a nice experience. Did you like India? Yeah, it was all right. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was interesting. I'd never been to India. Um, the people were very nice. A lot of people, you know, there are over a billion people there. And mm. you do get a sense you know, wherever you go in India, that there are a lot of people, even though it's a huge country. Um, but they were all extremely nice. Uh, I think the ladies look lovely in their saris, really lovely. Uh, beautiful dark hair, and, and they look so wonderful in those colourful saris. So, uh, it, you know, it was a very nice experience. Then you went, I think you went to Iceland as well, didn't you? Yeah, we went to Iceland. I quite enjoyed that programme because... You didn't know a lot about Iceland until you did the programme. Yeah, funny. no, yeah. well, as you say, I'd never been to Iceland. It's becoming, I think, quite a tourist destination now. You know, the experience for me was about the light, the fact that it doesn't get dark, you know, that it's mm. light all night long. You've got people, I remember some guy was mowing his lawn at three in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, the people were very nice and it was very open and kind of fresh. Um, but I think they want to be careful because I think there's only about 350,000 people there. Uh, and I, I think the, the locals are probably a little aware that it's becoming more fashionable to go mm. there. And, I, you know, the roads aren't very wide and there aren't many of them in that sense. You know, it's not like motorways everywhere. So they need to be a little bit careful that they don't get overrun by tourists. Although, you know, they do get a lot of cruise ships going there and stuff. Paul, did you... Did you find, because obviously you're so well-known in this country, all the people in the shows were well-known in this country. Yeah. Was it strange where you go to farm countries and people don't know that didn't know you were a singer or an actor or no, a TV I star? No, it doesn't worry me at all. I mean, I, I don't care. The one that they all do know, actually, is Dennis Taylor. Because mm. Dennis has been a world champion. Uh, snooker, you know, was broadcast everywhere and the great thing about being a snooker player if you want to be one known is that you're on for three or four hours at a shot you know when these matches go on and on so you know people knew Dennis in India and they knew a couple of guys knew him in in Iceland but for me I don't care I mean you know I, I tend to avoid that kind of thing anyway you sang a few songs in various things didn't you they sort of roped you in if i remember rightly didn't you did i sing something? yeah little... oh no we did it we did uh that's right we were with the lady boys briefly. that's it yeah yeah that was a good experience i don't think that i didn't watch the show because uh, again i don't watch it oh you don't no it came over very well oh i don't i don't watch myself on things i didn't watch myself in and perhaps i should but i don't i don't like watching my i never really did even when i was sort of young and reasonably you know well turned out i didn't watch myself it's probably a good idea to do that to watch yourself because you learn from your mistakes but i've always felt a bit uncomfortable and now at 110 i feel even more <laughs> more uncomfortable so i tend not to watch it and again you know the fact that i went off to iceland having done the, the big india show 
you know, I didn't go there with any preconceived ideas about how to behave or what to do from having seen myself. I just went on there and did it. So you've had a fantastic career, really, haven't you? You sort of still yearning to do things? Because I know also off stage you sort of presented and produced shows. Haven't yeah, you? we had Grease Out recently, which I co-produced, which we've produced for many, many years. Yeah, I mean, when I finish this, I'm about to uh, do a read-through of a play that a guy's written using Wendy and Sue from the show. Well, when we get to Cambridge, we're going to do a read-through of this new play. Uh, which I'm hoping that may turn into something that I can produce. So I've been working really since December, so I'm going to have a little holiday when this finishes. Uh, but, you know, when I come back, I certainly will have itchy feet. Yes. <laughs> well, you do like working, don't you? Yeah, well, I don't have any hobbies, you know. I always say I've got a shed at the bottom of my garden, which <laughs> I never go in. <laughs> but you look well, John. Well, yeah. You look very well, Tony. You look coordinated in blue. <laughs> You're impressed, This is your oh, yeah. good lady, I'm sure, <laughs> is, uh, is dressing you. Yeah. How did you know that? I can tell. <laughs> oh, you can, can you? Because I don't remember you being that coordinated <laughs> last time I met you. And I've got a pair of shoes like that. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. They're very nice, aren't they? Yes. Can I just publicly <laughs> thank you, because my daughter's worked with you, Caroline, yeah, on many, many Caroline. occasions, and I know she owes a lot to you because you were very kind to and her. And give her my love and a big kiss from, from yes. an old man. She liked working with you, you see. Good. Well, I, I hope to run into her again and hopefully see her again. Paul, thanks for your time on a busy day. It's always a real pleasure to talk to you because you've been there, you've done it, and you're a nice man. Thank you, John. <laughs> it's lovely talking to you too. And lots of luck in the future. Thank you. You're listening to John Hannam Meets... Isle of Wight Radio's original chat show. Grateful thanks to Paul Nicholas and the quartet tour continues to the Brighton Theatre Royal March the 26th to the 31st, the Cambridge Arts Theatre April the 3rd to the 7th, the Richmond Theatre April the 9th to the 14th and the Bath Theatre Royal April the 16th to the 21st. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight Radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for for more John Hannah Meets new interviews. Bye bye for now. I love white